World Cup qualifying windows are over and normal service has resumed. Clap football is back and there's a lot to get through. A Milan derby with Scudetto implications for both teams. A reinforced Barcelona takes on La Liga champions Atletico de Madrid. Two league leaders face off in the FA Cup and the Club World Cup gets underway in the United Arab Emirates. Oh, and let's not forget about the AFCON final. I'm joined by Christine Cooper, James Bench, and Michael Lahoud to break it all down. The Kigo Lasso Weekend Preview begins right now. Hey, everybody, welcome to Kigo Lasso. Yes, the international window is over. Enough of Jimmy Conrad and Heath Pierce. My God, I was getting tired. I'm kidding. I love my American Wonder Slices. Thank you so much for being part of the family. Make sure that you keep on following on YouTube. We're getting closer to 10,000 subscribers. Amazing. Thank you so much. And if you're listening to this on audio, by the way, make sure to follow Kigo Lasso wherever you get your pots. Take a minute to leave us a rating and review every little helps right then the king of lasso weekend previews back christine Cupo, how are you i am amazing amazing i am i am much better than our weather in new york right now but um i'm, I'm pretty pretty hyped about the upcoming derby absolutely a massive derby in seria christine always good to have you and listen here's the next thing james bench i feel like i haven't seen you in a year how are you my friend well, I mean, basically, it, your whole world has stopped, I believe, because European football has stopped. But it, it's so, I, I feel like I've, I've been like a, a man wandering through the desert, and all that I'm getting are the oases of Canada playing some amazing football. And thank God they beat the USA. It was such a special moment for me <laughs> watching my Canadian brethren, my guys, Jonathan David, Kyle Laren, and all the boys. Nine points from nine. Um, yeah, since you've last seen me, I've gone heel turn, and I'm now like ultra team Canada. Woo. My God. Well, careful, because Christine Cooper's here and, you know, she is a, a USMNT fan. Christine, how do you feel about this Canadian love from James Bench? Um, I don't know. I There is actually a massive Italian community in Canada, and I have nothing but love for them. And so I have already congratulated them on the leaps and bounds that program has made. It's impressive. You can't, as much as I want to be like, like it, you have to be like, wow, this is this is something. They've got something happening here. Absolutely. You can't hate but love uh, the Canadian power uh, they go through. But anyway, that was then. This is now. This is the weekend preview, and we're going to talk club soccer. By the way, Michael LaHood will join in later on to discuss much more. But we begin, everybody, in Serie A, the Milan derby. Inter against AC Milan. By the way, we have a massive Paramount Plus production our entire team is going there the first time a u.s soccer production at the san Siro. unbelievable but in terms of the game itself everybody this is huge inter of course lead uh the table said he has standings with a game in hand ac milan and christian vieri said if inter win ac milan are out of the scudetto race there's a lot to discuss here christine cupo first of all are you okay that you're not part of uh that you didn't go to Milan. I'm kind of sad. No, uh, no. Okay. First of all, time out. <laughs> I got news the same way everyone else did on the live broadcast. It's like the whole team is going. And I'm like, let me check my, let me check my text. <laughs> I'm like, you got ghosted. <laughs> bro. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. Um, it's I don't, fine. I don't hold grudges. I won't remember this for the rest of their natural lives <laughs> and beyond. Ah. All right. Well, let's focus on the game, Christine, for a second before James Ben right. jumps in, because uh, this is a massive game. Let, talk to me a little bit about the Derby de la Madonina for dummies. Like people obviously okay. know about the Derby. They know how big it is, but some may not. Just how big is this game? OK, this is the quick and dirty here. It's massive. OK, in terms of world football, it's massive as well. Um, this Derby, the first meeting was in 1909. Um this happens to be a extremely city, Chita specific derby, um, geographical. They share San Siro. Um, they also are just Goliaths. They are one of the only derbies in which both teams have won a Champions League. Um, so that's super important. And also, it's just very passionate, fiery, fiery bunch. This isn't your, um, like, this is your grandparents' derby. derby. Right. Like, <laughs> this is, yeah, this is about as muddy and mucky as it gets. Um, especially this season, we have Inter in first right now, a fairly dominant deep bench, um, slightly terrifying. I hate to admit that on every account. And then we have AC Milan in third, 
um, only four points off first. Um, but obviously, as Christian Vieri had commented to Gazeta de los Sports, um, this is pretty significant for both sides in terms of setting up their trajectory for the rest of the season. Um, if Inter don't lose, say, another three or four matches through May, like they're just going to keep plugging away. Um, and that's that's going to be a, a big shift in the table, finally. Um, we've had a pretty interesting early season with all of these teams where there's only been a few points spread across the first and 10th. And then all of a sudden it's starting to widen those gaps. So um, we've had really, really competitive football this season. Um, with that, um, the Derby della Madonnina, as it's known, um, or in English, the Derby of Little Madonna, um, is actually named after um, the Virgin Mary statue at the top of Duomo. Um, and, and that's, I think, like the, the quickest and easiest way to explain the Derby. Um, 80,000 seat stadium, uh, unfortunately at half capacity this go round just due to COVID protocols. But uh, last heard, it's entirely sold out. So I think it's 37,000 plus tickets sold. Um, it's going to be absolutely roaring. So on site, um, Mateo, Marco, Poppy, um, everybody's going to be. I, I, somebody Mom. better FaceTime me in, okay? Like I just want to <laughs> hear the actual sound on the ground. <laughs> Yeah, it's going to be it's going to be such a, a special game. But I, I think kind of on the foot, I mean, you know, as someone from North London, and I know Christine, you're a bit of a goon. I, I think some a lot of it with with a derby like this one, maybe even compared to, you know, you have the Derby d'Italia. It's the fact that this is within your the, your local community that you know Inter fans and or Milan fans, whoever's disappointed, you've got to go to work the next day, and or you've got to go to the cafe, and you're going to be hearing about it from everyone. You know. As as people connected to Arsenal, we know what it's like to give Tottenham fans endless grief because they it's happened again to them, um, and that you know that I think that's what makes this one of the if not the greatest derby in Europe. And what what's really special at the moment, and I was kind of thinking back, it's not happened as much as like I would think, is that this is really a moment when these two are, are at the very top or near the very top. Obviously, Napoli separating the two, but even if you go back to to the nineties when there was you know, that maybe the talent level was was at a similar level. Was Inter were always a little way off what you would expect when Milan were winning titles, Inter weren't fulfilling their potential. And then obviously in the early noughties, Inter were streaking ahead. There have been moments, but this does feel like we've got a great period for this rivalry. And uh, it should be a really fun game, though. I'm, I'm super worried about Milan's situation at the back. Absolutely. And that's where I kind of wanted to go. I wanted to focus a little bit um, on, on the squads themselves as we look ahead to this game, uh, to Christine's point about the differential in Serie A. Obviously, it's very important to Vieri's point. This is big for AC Milan. They, they really need something here. So, James, let me jump back to you here. Apparently, reports Ibrahimovic and Rebic will likely miss the game. And if that is so, where and how and how will AC Milan focus on their offensive side, especially an inter side, according to Denzel uh, Dumfries, they're not afraid of anybody. What can AC Milan do here if Ibrahimovic and Rebic can't play? Ibra, you can you can live without. And let you know the reason AC Milan signed Olivier Giroud is they were like, well, we might need to live without Zlatan. He's five thousand now, so <laughs> that will be fine. I I would wonder whether Rebic would even start anyway. Maybe as yeah. a sort of you know pressing number nine. But you've got players like Salamakas, Junior Macias. They're really valuable uh, options to play on the right wing. And then Rafa Le Leao, my God, this kid is like something special. I mean, he's kind of, I, I remember speaking to him about 18 months ago, maybe a year ago. Um, and then he was just sort of talking about being inspired by Ibrahimovic. And, you know, he felt like though he, he felt he was giving the impression that he was someone that had a long way to go. Well, he's gone a long way really quickly. So for me, you know, as, as I alluded to earlier, my question marks with Milan is that defence. I know these aren't new injuries, but no Simon Kier for the rest of the season. The Kyo mm -hmm. Tomori, I think he's he's kind of coming he'll back to training. But I heard they're not there. rushing him. I don't think he'll be back in here. So that makes Ibra question, which Cassie question, Tomori probably definitely out. Then you have Calabria, Florenzi, Tonali, and Romagnoli just coming back from international duty. I I feel for them is what I'll say right now. <laughs> So you're leaning, you think, towards an Inter Milan win here, Christine? Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, they have the most wins in, in this derby. They, mm -hmm. I, like, I, not that that means anything, right? So, you know, like age-old wins don't really 
amount to much this season, but I think that the way that things are stacked up, um, especially with the transfer window, I mean, Inter were really conservative too. Like there's not going to be too much change and they already were significant. I, I'm leaning Inter, unfortunately. I would like that to not be the case. I want everything to get chaotic and disrupted. Um, it's anybody's game though, right? That's the beauty of this. Yeah, I mean, looping back to to what we're talking about and what uh, Christian Vieri's been saying, I do feel like a lot of the the air and the excitement would really fall out of this title race if if Inter won. Um, as much as that seems like the logical result, based on the uh, based on the players available and the the form book, it it's just it, they're, they're just such an effective winning machine. I think they're a lot easier on the eye than than people give credit for. Francesco Porzio wrote. wrote wrote really well hard to say about this uh, a few weeks back on our site about just how effectively Simone and Zaghi has has managed what we're all kind of forgetting was a a really tough start to to live as inter manager losing Lukaku losing Hakimi losing yeah. Ericsson it, it, they are not I mean they're they're good to watch but they're a bit boring because they get results and I think they could really turn this title race into a procession and for Milan as well suddenly you're looking over your shoulder a Juventus with Vlavic uh you know Napoli Atalanta it's it's a lot more pressure on Milan that's for sure yeah I mean and going back to Christine's point about you know how recently well they do against AC Milan Inter have lost only one of their last 11 Serie A meetings against AC Milan, that was back in October 2020. And also to the other point away, uh, regarding, never mind the, uh, the defensive side, Christina, of, of AC Milan. I mean, after their uh, stalemate against Juventus, AC Milan could fail to score in consecutive league games for the first time since February of last year. They last drew successive league games in December 2020. So offensively, and if we're talking about Ibrahimovic not being able, Rebic, whatever, I mean, everything is pointing to an Inter Milan win if there is somewhere and by the way i forgot about you know chinaglu who like you know is going to be facing a little bit of a contentious derby so where do you see it if ac milan can take anything here frank cassie we haven't talked about him yet how important is he in this game i mean i think that everyone will have a significant role in this game only mm. because I, I just think that inter are way more rounded um and they have more at their disposal at this point um i don't know james what do you think yeah, Kessier, he was so good at AFCON. He's the potential kind of, maybe he is the, the player that can just win this midfield battle. It's tough. Like, into that three of, of Brozovic in particular and uh, Barella and then Chalanolu a bit further forward, they're so solid and so hard to get the ball off and so hard to get past. I think Kessier, at his best, he does have that, that dynamism, verticality, however you want to call it, that means he can kind of just, rush through a midfield and get quick ball to lay out, get quick ball to Salamakas, whoever it might be. But, you know, even as I'm saying all this, I just, uh, I just can't kind of talk myself into, into, into not into. Yeah, well, I like that. That's a, now that's a hard sentence to say. Uh, well, let's go into the score prediction then before we move on. James Bench, uh, Des Norris, our producer, did put up those betting tips if you're watching on YouTube, so you can go back to that. But James Bench, give me your, your score prediction for this one. Yeah, I'll go 2 0 Inter. 2 0 Inter. CC? Um, I'm going to go 2 1 Inter. 2 1. I think I'm going to go with 2 1 as well. I think Milan will get one. It might be a late one, but it will begin 2 0 uh, and maybe a late goal. For AC Milan. All right, let's uh, let's move on here. Let's took up uh, of all the remaining fixtures, of course, because it is, you know, the return of some club football and on Serie A, the action keeps rolling. By the way, Inter AC Milan Saturday noon Paramount Plus. Okay, historic time because US production at the San Siro. But it all begins with Roma against Genoa, Fiorentina, Lazio, Atalanta, Cagliari, uh, Christine Cooper's Juventus plays on Sunday against Verona. Christine Kupo, do some Vlaovic very quick. I mean, how happy are you? Ooh, honestly, this will be um, a key piece to this puzzle that we needed for quite some time. Um, I, I, I'm I, not enthused about the, like, oh, the Ronaldo replacement framing of it um, mm. because I think that this kid has major potential. Um, I don't think he needs to step into anyone else's shadow, but I think that it will bring us back up the table. For sure. Um, Dennis uh, Zakaria will be another one that fortifies the midfield that okay. we picked up. Um, some of the exits. Honestly, Juve were huge winners this transfer window. They crushed it. 
um, thank the gods. Um, <laughs> but um, they did. It was a very much of a Juventus is back kind of uh, statement with Dusan Vlahovic, I feel. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. I just hope that he continues on his streak of just banging goals because that's what we need desperately. 100%. James Benj, anything to take note here from the weekend uh, in Serie A? Yeah, I, I'm I'm kind of hyped for, for seeing Vlaovic's old club, uh, Fiorentina, not just because they will be super, super unhappy to have sold Dusan Vlaovic to Juventus of all teams. We know that the Fiorentina fans and the people of Florence, they hate selling to Juventus. Goes right the way back to Roberto Baggio. I just hope, I'm begging you, any Fiorentina fans, that listen, please don't trash your wonderful city in anger. Please. <laughs> um, they also, though, have a super exciting replacement um, for him, Artur Cabral, who they picked up from yep. the Swiss yep. League. Um, Basel, yeah. Icone yeah. they got. They also yeah. got Piatek. I think that Fiorentina were like the quiet, like we're going to stuff this money in our bag from Vlaovic and just like, Send, send us those three. It's fine. Yeah. So, you know, it could be by default a, a good thing for Fiorentina as they can invest in many different areas. By the way, Desnora's producer, thank you so much. Worth mentioning that Chucky Lozano did dislocate his shoulder uh, during the international window for El Tri. Uh, that was against Panama. So, you know, that's something to watch out for, especially as Napoli continue to try and fight. They've had a lot of injuries throughout and they face Venezia uh, this weekend. Christine Cooper, before... We say goodbye to you. It's always good to have you. So happy that you're here. Anything else that you want to bring up? James Bench mentioned we all know you're a gooner as well. I don't know if you have any Pierre Emerick Aubameyang <laughs> thoughts or anything, but anything you want to say before we say goodbye to you, Christine? No, no, I'm I'm still um, either optimistic or delusional enough to think that we can still clinch a top four spot. <clears throat> Premier League. Um, James, please. I only have so much happiness that I can keep to myself. And this is one of those things. Okay. Um, but yeah, come on, you gunners. But uh, I, I think that's about it. I'm, I'm looking forward to just kicking back into the season and seeing, you know, how these transfers play out. Um, I think we're going to get a really, really interesting remainder of Serie A. So. I love it. I love it. Kristen Cooper, thank you so much for being here. That's C. Cooper on Twitter. Make sure you follow her. She has an amazing dog called Gigi. I want a dog like that, but they're too good looking for me. I can't deal with a dog <laughs> like that. Uh, but Kristen Cooper on Twitter, make sure that you follow all her content. Of course, part of our CBS sports team is specifically for Serie A. Thank you so much. Arrivederci, Kristen Cooper. Grazie. Ciao a tutti. Ciao. Ciao, ciao. We're going to take a break. And when we come back, we continue the rest of the action, including the FA Cup, the Africa Cup of Nations final, and so much more in Europe. Que golazo. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody. Que golazo weekend preview. We've talked Serie A, Christian Cooper, of course, and now we talk much more in the game, including club football and a very important final to look ahead to. James Bench continues to be with us. And now we welcome once again, uh, it looks like you've, you're part of a Gap commercial right now, Michael. <laughs> you look so good. Michael, how are you, my friend? Uh, it's good to be back. I'm refreshed. It, 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 and of course, as soon as I feel refreshed, the weather in Texas, of all places, looks like it's Alaska. Don't come here, folks. It's not the time of the year for it. <laughs> yeah, you were telling us before taping that uh, Texas is not is, is is not prepared for 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 ultimate rain, is it? No, I, I got my car stuck in a mud pit. <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> well, yeah, this morning I, I was coming in, feeling good, had my Cortave, was even getting in the mood, and then boom! But the show must go on, as they say. The show must go on. James Bench, as somebody that lives in England, you can all too relate with, uh, you know, people not being able to deal with the uh, extensive weather. I mean, bizarrely, rain is about the only weather we can deal with in our country. <laughs> that one, we've got it. Literally anything else. Sort of temperature below, I've got, I don't know what these are in, fa in Fahrenheit, but below like five degrees Celsius or above 15, we fall apart as a nation. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, God knows how our team would have coped with those USMNT conditions. <laughs> well, it would have been over after five minutes. Are you kidding yeah. me? No yeah. chats. No chats. Uh, but welcome, Michael. Thank you so much for being here. James Benjo, of course. Que golazo weekend preview. Michael, I know that when you joined in, obviously you weren't part of the Serie A chat, but you do have some thoughts about a certain player in this derby. Talk to me. Yeah. So everyone's talking about how dominant Inter Milan has been. Look, no Ibra. 
no problem. Leal has been the answer. He's a young player, and he has versatility. Oftentimes when Ibra has been out, or even Giroud, he's been a bit of a continued enigma in that striker role. Leal has been the answer for this Milan team. Him and Theo Hernandez, they have been the revelations of this season. And, and I think that is going to be a deciding factor, how Inter cope with Leal's trickery in terms of his direct dribbling ability. He can beat you going to his left and get to the byline and cross. He can also chop it to his right and aim for that top corner or bottom corner. He's dynamic, and I think that matchup between Inter's outside back and Handanovic could be the standout player that gives Inter the win if they win, and Leal could be the difference maker for Milan if they're to win. Only 22 years old, uh, Rafael Leal. He's uh, quite the star, so absolutely right. All right, let's move on here, and let's talk about Africa Cup of Nations. It's been quite a ride. Obviously, Michael, you've been part of our preview so far. James Benji, obviously, we would love for you to chime in. But as we're taping, everybody, just a disclaimer, we're taping this before Cameroon's game against Egypt, okay? So we're going to try and be a little uh, playful with this in general with it. But we know, of course, Senegal. Senegal, by the way, who have never won this. Amazing, Michael Lahoud. How, what, what, what say you about Senegal and making it to the final? Remember when we did the preview show? Yep. Remember when we did the preview show and we asked who was going to win? I'm, I wish we had our guy, Nigerian Scams, the scammer of them all. <laughs> <laughs> wish we had him on the show. I will be cheating I'm glad him. we but, don't, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To- Tosin would be getting heated right now. But... <laughs> Senegal is the team I picked. Yes. Sorry, Sierra Leone. I, you know you have my heart, but Senegal is the team I picked because they have way too much depth. They are the deepest team in AFCON. They started this tournament with COVID running through the camp. They, they had key players, goal, starting goalkeeper, didn't play the first couple of games. Star center back, who's their talisman and, and captain defensively, didn't play the first couple of games. And they were not looking good. They barely squeaked through the group stages. Offense wasn't clicking. But in major tournaments, especially AFCON, it's not how you start. It's getting hot at the right time. In the knockout round, they have been in fuego. And the player that has been the catalyst for so much was the man who got the man of the match yesterday. It's Mane Mane. Saidu Mane. He looked more like the Mane of Liverpool. And just his ability to react off of defensive miscues. Burkina Faso, they have done well to get to the semifinals. Congrats to them. But it's that little bit of quality in the final third. It's what happens when a team gives you a gift, that lapse of concentration. And Mane, he pounced on it, and that's the difference. That's why they're in the final. Completely agree. I mean, I would also maybe just, you mentioned the mic, the guys at the other end. I think one of the things was even when Senegal started slowly, you knew they weren't giving up a lot of opportunities. Teams were finding it really hard Mm -hmm to score on them. And that's how you build in these tournaments. And I mean, if we kind of look, you know, the, the other semifinal that we're still waiting on, Egypt are basically still doing that. They're still like, yeah. well, we'll defend and hope Mo can bail us out at the other end. It's a really successful, you know, way to get deep in tournaments. And I just kind of think in that final, I wouldn't doubt for a minute because I've seen Edouard Mendy do it in the biggest games. I've seen Kaladu Koulibaly do it week in, week out for years. You know, there's every one of those players in that that Senegal team now. You can you can really rely on to get the result. So you know that whatever happens against whichever opponent, they're not going to make it. That they're, they're not going to make it easy for the other team to win. Yeah, and, and another talking point of this Senegal team, and I think if Egypt are to make it to the final, it's going to be the subs. Egypt, oh. they have you. You know him, Luis Trezeguet. He has been the difference maker coming in, gaining form, and he delivered. Yeah, I just wish he stayed fit Morocco. for Villa. He, he, he saves yeah. all that fire for, for Egypt. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Trezeguet. Hey, <laughs> you know, he's, he knows where his bread is buttered for now. Yeah, that, that's but, true. That's but true. Treze, Trezeguet for Egypt has been a difference maker. And oftentimes, that is the difference when you get to finals of major tournaments. And also for Senegal, Ismail Yassar. He, he came in in that game. Know, yesterday, and he he changed the game. He he's a, he can play anywhere. He can play wide. He can play center midfield. But kind of like a Leal that we were talking about before, he's such a good dribbler. He he just a drop of a shoulder, and he's gone. And before they scored that first goal, it was his run to the byline, and then skinning a defender that forced the corner, and then bang, 
Senegal gets the opening goal. I probably should hit on Cameroon as well. I mean, the host Let's and, do it. and the story of the tournament. Uh, I mean, and the story of the tournament for me is that that front two, Carl Toko Akambi and Vincent Abubakar, who mm. is getting that move back to Europe if he wants it. Now, you know, we all like the Saudi Arabian money, I can tell you that. But, <laughs> you know, he has been phenomenal and utterly, utterly dominant. Six Such a goals great, in the tournament so far. That's great right. partnership yeah. with Akambi that if I were, you know, a yeah. buying club in the summer, I'd be thinking, if I'm going to buy one, can I try and get the other one in from, from Leon? Or, because... It, it's you know it's like one of those classic strike partnerships that that work really well. Abubakar dominates the penalty area. Akambi's willing to go wide, drag defenders with him. I mean, he's scoring a lot as well. And was was yeah. fantastic in the in the quarterfinals. There's m- so much more to, to Cameroon than than this front two. And I keep mm-hmm. writing this in all my previews, but then you keep going. There is more to them. But have you seen how good this front two is? Yeah, right. right. I mean, I do and, want... and to this point, by the way, about Cameroon and Egypt, we don't know yet who's going to go through. I do love Abubakar's comments about Salah doing a little Shania Twain. He doesn't impress him much, by the way. Like He was, like, he was asked about Mohamed Salah, and he was like, yeah, he's good, but he doesn't create that much. I, I You know what? I love that. I love that because you, you expect a generic answer, right, from, from him. And he's like, Mohamed Salah, meh. We'll take care of business. Obviously, as you listen or watch this, we'll have an answer. But whoever Senegal faces, Michael, it's going to be – there's problems. There's problems to deal with because each team obviously are here for a reason. Yeah, Egypt, they, they sit in a mid-block or they sit deep as the game goes on, and then they counter. Mohamed Salah – look, this this tournament was made for Mohamed Salah and mm-hmm. Sadio Mane – to reach the finals. And it but, didn't begin like that, Michael. Remember, no, the first game against Nigeria, he was very, very quiet. Oh, my gosh. Both both players yeah. look a shadow of themselves. The the conditions were talked about with the pitch, and then it was talked about the weather. But now it seems like the rain is making them feel right at home as if they were in Liverpool because both players are stepping up. And, and that's the difference in latter stages of AFCON is you want your biggest players – to step up when you need them most. Last tournament, it was Riyad Mahrez who stepped up for Algeria. He banged in the winner, and that's why he's the captain. That's why they pay him the big bucks at City, and he leads his team. Now it's time for both of these players to step up. But you, as you said, Benji, you can't count out, the, count out this Cameroon team. They have looked unstoppable. They're a juggernaut. The home fans, I think, could be the difference in the semifinal and final, but – you, you still have to play the game, and it's oftentimes when you play the quote-unquote underdogs, like in Egypt, that, that's when you find out what your team's really about. And a, a stat that I remember, I, I want to I do more research on it, but let's just say it's a, it's a Lahoud mood sort of stat. <laughs> I, feel, I, 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 I think that teams that win big tournaments, Champions League, World Cups, Club World Cups, no matter what it is, you have to be tested in the semifinal round or quarterfinals because you have to be battle tested when you reach the finals. That's the easy part. I think the the winner of this game today, as much as I predicted Senegal and I, I want to look like a genius, but as much as I predicted them, I think the real winner is going to come out of the winner of this game because that, that team is going to be battle tested and have the confidence that they can go and beat anyone. Well, we will see. Fantastic stuff there from Michael LaHood and James Bench. Let's move on now and let's go to England. Uh, the FA Cup fourth round, James Bench. So is an interesting one. There's some very intriguing fixtures, of course. Everton, Frank Lampard's Everton. Frank Lampard and Ashley Cole's Everton. Uh, freshly renewed Everton, at least from the last few weeks, against Brentford. Christian Eriksen and Brentford, they're facing off each other. Man City against Fulham. It's the league leaders against the league leaders, of course, in respective tables. And uh, we'll get to other fixtures in a second. But talk to me about the FA Cup fourth round, James Bench. What are you looking at? I mean, that Everton game is going to be really fun, mostly because we've got the new manager in Frank Lampard and just a load of Frank Lampard players. Deli yeah. Alley, uh, Donny van der Beek, you know, even guys like, I could definitely, Rich, he could turn Richarlison into another Frank Lampard star player. And I just wonder, are the training sessions just going to be sort of endless third man runs and cutbacks to the edge of the area? <laughs> Lampard's doing that and he's like, Ashley, you can, you can do the defending. I'll work with these guys on slamming it in from 18 yards out. I mean, it, that that to me is, a, is quite an exciting one. I think, I mean, then the one that I'm going to, just in hope 
prayer of an upset Chelsea Plymouth Argyle. I mean, that that was my choice. Also, it's 7.30 a.m. Eastern time, 12.30 my time. So that means I'm done for the weekend nice and early. <laughs> Those are <laughs> cracking games. And also, I mean, it's a shame that they didn't get a home tie and it's a shame that it, they didn't get a Premier League team. But Boreham Wood from yeah. the uh, Vanarama National League, I've been, so for a team that I've never seen play, I've been to their ground dozens of times they host the Arsenal under 23s the Arsenal women's team so seen a lot of that place um they're not at home uh, they're at that the vitality but uh, it's a really fun family club um and I mean you know certainly if I could pick one tie and, and pick the result in it it'd be amazing if Boreham Wood could uh, could get through to the fifth round um, yeah. maybe I think Bournemouth might might rest a few players because the teams that you see rotate the most at this stage always the teams up at the higher end of the championship who are mm. thinking promotion is the number one priority. Yeah. I, I'm, you love to hate them. If you're an Arsenal fan, you, you love to love them. Um, Tottenham till I die. I, I think that the Spurs Brighton game could be a really interesting one. Spurs coming off that loss against Chelsea looked like the, the Tottenham Hotspurs that you, you, you go home and you bang your head on the table. If you're a Spurs fan, um, more of the same. And it'll be interesting to see how they respond. They, they've gotten a bit of rest. They've, they've, did, they've cleaned out some of the old garbage um, that was kind of weighing them down. They, Antonio Conte has more of his team now. And Brighton, they've been awesome to watch. I, I really like Mopue, um and, and some of their new signings that they brought in. Um, you know, is it the Argentinian that came in, um, McAllister? Alexis yeah, McAllister. he's done really well. I he? really like him. Um, so he got COVID during the international window, by the way. So we'll see if he can recuperate in time. So that's a, a big issue. But to your point about Tottenham, Michael, you know, they brought in some Juventus, uh, you know, faces. Because yeah. he's yeah. a player. And obviously, of course, Rodrigo Bentancur as well. So, you know, who would you have in that game then, if you were thinking? Because Brighton are a very well-managed team as well. Yeah, uh, you, you got to go Spurs, Antonio Conte, because solely of Antonio Conte, not so much down to the players. I think he's getting more of his imprint into this team, out with a lot of the old, in with the new, and he will have this team riled up for a response. Antonio Conte believes in cup competition, whether it's in England or in Italy, he'll have this team taking this very seriously. Yeah. I mean, the, the you had a fun is, fact, James Bench. I, I want yeah. you to say it. You wrote well, it in I'm, your private chat, and I want you to say it. No, it's but, Des wrote it, but now I'm stealing it. Oh, my God, it. Des did write it. I'm sorry. Des, amazing. <laughs> James Bench, say Des's uh, comment on private messages, please. Uh, a fun fact here. Uh, I am the worst person to say this, by the way. Oh, wait. Des is saying <laughs> he's joking. Des, you just completely put – say it anyway, James, and then let's hope it's true. Um, his brother is named after the protagonist of, of Home Alone. <laughs> Can I let you in our secret? I don't know who that is. Yeah, Kevin McAllister. But I thought I thought it was <laughs> yeah. just, I thought it, I thought it was a fact. And Des is joking. His name is Kevin McAllister, but is it because of Home Alone? That, would be, that is actually his name. But whether he was named because of Home Alone, I don't know. But so I've never seen Home Alone. James, but what? <laughs> well, I can't watch it now though either. Can I? I can't watch it for another. 11 months I'm yeah but you this is oh ridiculous. my gosh michael what do you make of that i mean come on I, yeah, yeah. you gotta watch you know, the first one at least i i we we did you know total sidebar we did a what's your favorite christmas movie of all time and we chose home alone to kick start the christmas season and just when you think you remember everything about home alone I stand corrected. I know nothing. It's been <laughs> decades since I watched the movie, so I'm not the right person to ask. Well, James, how have you never seen? Okay, I don't want to stick to this uh, so much, but this is no, really keep going. <laughs> I, I just, <laughs> I, don't, I just, if I'm watching a Christmas film, it's the Muppets Christmas Carol, and then yeah, you kind that's of, a good you, choice. Yeah, I'm just uh, okay. That's, that's my Christmas film, and then yeah. you know, I no, uh, yeah, I it just looks a bit, um, it just looks a bit obnoxious. The kid. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. He looks a bit annoying. I'm not going to watch no, it. No, yeah. No, yeah shame on you taking care of that house by yourself. Can I talk about Antonio Conte? Yes, please. Yeah. I'm, so I, I totally understand why he's made the changes he's he's made to that squad and in particular that midfield. Mm. Because every, every one of his more creative midfielders had kind of underperformed under him and beforehand. 
but I'm looking at the kind of midfields he's going to be putting out, and we think it maybe will be the three five two. That's what he's used a lot, and and I know that as well that a lot of the creativity that comes in Conte teams comes from stretching the pitch as wide as possible, using the wing backs. He needed a right wing back, by the way, but I do think there's no one in that in that midfield squad who can just slip a through ball or can play a key pass and. Mm. I still think Spurs are favourites for top four. I think they'll win this game quite comfortably as well. But I do wonder if losing and sidelining all three of Ndombele, Ali and Lo Celso was was worth doing. I think in particular, I know Lo Celso is not always fit, but he's OK. And you, I could see him doing what was Conte doing with Lo Celso, what he did with Fabregas, what he did with Ericsson. Right. I find it a bit weird. I just want to make, I just want to, make it clear did we compare Lo Celso to Cesc Fabregas <laughs> <laughs> this comes from, so, so Jack Pitbrook at The Athletic wrote a fantastic piece off the back of uh conversation you in this conversation as well Luis uh, that Cesc Fabregas and Luis Garcia had for CBS um, yeah. where they kind of spoke about how Conte like stripped all the creativity out of Cesc Fabregas and then started again and I know Mm. Look, as you say, Lo Celso, not on the same level, but just someone that can create a bit more, play a few, play a few three yeah. balls. Well, I'll tell you what, that's not Rodrigo Bentancur. I was reading a few headlines mm, yeah. over there saying, oh, my God, maybe Conte has found his new Andres Iniesta or whatever. And I'm just like, <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> like, Enough. calm down. Oh, my yeah. God. So, Michael, to that point that James Bench just said, Tom, we'll talk about, we'll, we'll wrap up FA Cup in a second mm. um, or now. But just before we move on, you know, I, I feel like sometimes James does a little bit of a reverse psychology because he's saying Tottenham will yeah. get top four, not <laughs> Arsenal. Do you, th- yeah. do you think that? Do you think Tottenham will, can get as high as a top four spot? I, I think they have a very realistic chance. And it it's not so much as down to two center midfielders or the creativity in the middle of the park. It's mm. down to what they have in attack. I think uh, Steve Birdwine, what he proved in that Leicester game, he's still an asset. Now you have a player who can come off the bench. Players have to accept their roles. I think that's what's been missing in this Tottenham team. But now when you remove the Deli Alleys and some of the other players, now players have their roles established and mm. you can move forward and Antonio Conte can build his team in the way he wants. I think Yinmin Song coming back healthy, that will be the difference. They need him in order to make top four. Him, Kane, Lucas Moore, and Bernwine, that front rotation, that's going to make the difference. Informed players like that get you top four. And then Kusulevsky, of course, is part of that as well. And there's only one Premier League game in the FA Cup fourth round, Burnley against Watford. And that is your FA Cup fourth round. Let's move on now. Let's talk about La Liga. Spain coming back. Uh, plenty of storylines, of course, but we have to begin with Barcelona. Uh, newly revamped Barcelona. Amazing uh, what a Goldman Sachs loan can do for you as they bring in a few talented players to strengthen that squad as they face the defending champions of La Liga, Atletico Madrid. James Bench, let's begin with you. This is a massive game. Adama Traore, Abamian, Ferran Torres. Can Xavi make it work? Can this finally happen? This is a big game for them, especially as they look to climb up that table. It's very interesting that he's brought in a striker that about two years ago, he very specifically said was not the sort of striker he wants in his team. You know, Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang is play on the last shoulder still. And, you know, we've not seen a lot of him play on the last shoulder, run in behind, stretch the defence. That is not what Xavi's Barcelona are about. That's not what Xavi is about. You know, we know this. He said he literally named Aubameyang and said, I wouldn't want a striker like Aubameyang. Now, obviously, the deal here is, you know, it's the deal with the devil of, we think this guy can get us back into the top four in a way. Yeah. That Before we go into away. Barcelona, James Ben, you've written about Aubameyang and his relationship with Arteta and what happened at Arsenal. Anything to add? Because obviously Aubameyang said in his press conference, look, um, it was with him, basically. Uh, yes. You know, so what happened? Oh, I mean, this whole month has been an incredibly draining month of covering Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang and moves to Saudi Arabia, moves to Barcelona and wherever. But there was a lot of, and I think uh, Ober expressed this in his press conference, but people that that, that know him well kind of explained to me that there was a real like befuddlement and confusion as to how one, what they thought was one incident and Arsenal will tell you it's a lot, but what they thought was one incident where he flew back a day late from visiting his mother who has been really ill 
Uh, he flew back a day late. It was at training when he was supposed to be, but just flew back on the wrong day. And that led to him, you know, basically being kicked out of Arsenal. And, you know, people around Arsenal will tell you, the minute the captaincy was taken off him, there was no way back. Never was. Mm. So he, you know, and he says in the press conference, my issue was with Arteta. I don't really know what happened, but it's not been nice. I've tried to stay calm. I mean, and that was totally true. Um, he tried to stay calm until the last possible minute when he then flew out to Barcelona without either club being aware or having authorised it. Uh, I mentioned this on our transfer pod, but I was texting people at Arsenal going, hey, um, can you kind of give me some steer on where the deal's at? Because Aubameyang's in Barcelona. And they were saying, he's not in Barcelona. I was like, no, he is. Here's a video of him in Barcelona. (laughs) It ended in quite chaotic fashion. Um, But I mean, a real breakdown of relationships, whether or not... um, you know, we're going to see the old Aubameyang, the the, the striker that was yeah. 20 goals a season guaranteed. I don't know, because he wasn't like that. But he was moved around a lot at Arsenal. He was played out of position. The rest of the team was struggling. So we shall see. But uh, it's certainly a, a change that I think Aubameyang really feels he needed and worked so hard, taking a big pay cut to get. I'm excited to see what he does. Uh, I, I was looking forward to seeing Aubameyang at AFCON and covid and really health complications ruined that. And it, it was a scary thing to, mm-hmm. to see a player go through that in, in the midst of a, a massive major tournament, but also a, a big point in his career. Now, new pastors, hopefully greener pastors for his sake, because he's when he's on, he's a, he's a heck of a player. Arsenal fans, remember, he was the guy who put the team on his back and won you an FA Cup. <laughs> Um, so I, I, I always hate to see players when the relationship turns sour with the manager and then the club to go out like that, but such is life in European football. The player that I'm more interested in seeing how he impacts his team is Adama Traore. This guy looks like a WWE, WWE wrestler when he's on the field. And Returning to Barcelona, by the way, because it, yeah. was, it all began there. Yeah. Oh, I, I love watching him play when he's focused when his head's in the game he needed a new challenge and he could be the player that barcelona fans are are talking about saying welcome home and thank you um in getting them into the top four they're they're not out for as for as dramatic of a season that they had they're in fifth place no they, yeah i mean they, Xavi, Xavi has done things yeah i mean the yeah, only they, thing that worries me about adama Trari, uh benji is that you know again just like we were talking about Aubameyang and how he's going to fit and et cetera. You know, Adama Traore also is making me wonder, how are you going to fit here? Because, I mean, you know, he learned La Masia kind of way, but he's a very direct, uh, go wide, penetrate the box. Xavi's about penetrating the box in a slightly different way. I'm not saying it's not going to work. I'm just very intrigued to see how it works out. I do have a theory on this. Mm. My idea is that he, even if he might, we might see him play right wing early on, I think if you're going to get the best out of him for a team like Barcelona, right back. Yeah. Make him, and he, you have Danny Alves to teach him, make him your next mm. starting right back. You know, the, he, he certainly has the strength to be able to defend, uh, even if he's not got the, the technical chops. But if he's got no end product, it seems like an ideal solution is just to have him further back where he doesn't need to score, doesn't need to assist quite as much. So, yeah it's still a weird signing and not the kind of, not the, the sort that Barcelona would make under normal circumstances. But I, I love watching this guy take on machine. will run past five players, then run past them all again, just because he can. <laughs> yeah. I think it's worth the gamble. It's funny because he actually feels like he would fit better for Barcelona's opponent this weekend, Atletico Madrid, as opposed to Barca. But regardless, that's the game they're playing. And to Michael's point, Atleti are fourth. 36 points. Barcelona are fifth, 35 points. It's a big one. All right, quick score predictions in this one. Michael, what do you have? Ooh, I think seeing Atleti, they they haven't been good defensively. They've given up more goals in Barcelona, and their team is the foundation of this team is defense. That's how they won mm. matches and won the league last year was being tight defensively. I, I think Barcelona is going to win. When you get new signings, it gives your team life. I remember that as a player. There's excitement that comes in. And on the the flip side for Atleti, Luis Suarez isn't the same Luis Suarez last year that was motivated. He proved his point to Barcelona. I I think there's too many distractions going on in that Atleti team. So Barcelona 2-1. 
I, I agree with pretty much everything Mike said, but then you know what I do? I go, oh, yeah, it's Atleti in a sort of big La Liga game. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we know what they like to do here. But yeah, I, I would, I, I, I think you can kind of almost, even from afar, and I'm not a Barcelona follower, but you can feel that mm. the last few weeks has given them a bit of a lift. Maybe it's not the best way to spend all that Goldman Sachs money that you need to keep your <laughs> club alive. But, you know, I think, yeah, I think Mike's right. I think they'll win. Uh, yeah, and as we're taping this, Antoine Griezmann is a serious doubt for that game, which would be a uh, shame for Atleti as well. So that's a big thing to think about. Desnars, let's throw up the rest of those fixtures in La Liga. On the screen as La Liga returns. Anything there, uh, Michael, that is uh, catching your eye? Celta Vigo, Rayo Vallecano, of course, is a good one. Sevilla, by the way. Let's not forget about Sevilla. Mm -hmm. We're really trying to fight and get that top spot once again. Anything from La Liga this weekend? I, I keep your eye on the Valencia-Real Sociedad match. Real Sociedad... I, I like watching them play. They've had similar starts to the season where they, they come out like gangbusters and there's talk of will they, won't they? Mm. And then they fade a bit more where the depth of your typical top four teams, your Sevillas, your Madrids, and years past your Barcelonas, Atletico Madrids have then shown. But this is a big game for Sociedad. Valencia, they're, they're such an enigma. They're not as strong as they have been in years past. But they they will push you to the limit. They pushed Atleti to the limit a few weeks back when they played their last league game against them, losing three two. So it'll be interesting to see how Sociedad responds. Yeah, I'm with Mike there. Although this Valencia team looking quite fun, like fun young team now. Lake, Lake, Lakes Moriba and Brian Hill arriving. But um, yeah, I'll keep an eye on on Sevilla as well. And I believe Anthony Martial is their luxury addition, mm. which is yep. great. It makes them sound like they've got like they bought everyone hot chocolate for the stand. <laughs> so uh, yeah, well, I'm a big fan of that. You know, I think he could. You, I just don't know what Martial could be. Um, I think we will find out at Sevilla, whether he's, whether it's kind of the Man United vortex of making good players bad or Ooh. whether he could be a, a really, really good player, which I still think there's something there. I agree. I think it's uh, definitely that. I think he's going to rejuvenate himself in a very good Sevilla team. All right, let's uh, finish up here before we say goodbye, James Mench. Michael LaHood, final thoughts uh, from anything really. There, uh, Bayern Munich is playing Leipzig, yeah. Lille against PSG, and the Club World Cup. I know you've all been waiting for that. Uh, on Saturday, Al Ali against Monterrey, Al Hilal against Al Jazeera, Ol Pereira, and of course, Chelsea begins next week. James Bench, anything from you know uh, the weekend looking ahead? Final thoughts. Yeah, I, my final thoughts are to express my extreme indifference, and I know I'm going to be on the preview pod for this, to express my extreme <laughs> indifference for the Club World Cup. Maybe this, <laughs> maybe this is just a Eurocentric, arrogant, Eurocentric view where I just think my European team is going to turn up and beat whoever South America has to offer in the final, which they quite often don't. Uh, but by God, it's a bit boring, isn't it? I'm so Having glad you're part that, of our preview, James. Uh... <laughs> over in a week. <laughs> Well, James, I'm really happy you're part of our preview for that. And, uh, I'm so excited to have you for that. Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> that scares me, yeah. Michael, final thoughts, buddy. I'm looking forward to that PSG little game solely because PSG against Nice, they went from looking like Les Parisiens to Les Parisiens. They look bad. They, they've spent all this money just for the sake of trying to buy that Champions League trophy. Mm. They had somewhat of a plan in place that looked like it was the Mauricio Pochettino show, but now it's all coming apart. Uh, they, they, they're looking like the runaway brides of Liga, but these are the type of games that further sow the seeds of discord and discontent in the locker room. And, and I think a game like this against Lille could have bigger implications in the tournament that they're going after the most, the Champions League. If you have a bad result, then it's going to be a tough go for them in the next round of the Champions League. Yeah, and you know what? And I guess what does that say about Liga in itself? Because PSG a number one, 53 points, 11 points ahead of Nice. And uh, of course, Lille have a lot to do in order to climb up that table. But to your point, Mauricio Pochettino's stock, I guess, is continuing to dwindle down as they also get ready for Real Madrid, by the way. Uh, my only final thought is Kidderminster playing West Ham. 
That's Robert mm -hmm. Plant from Led Zeppelin's Kidderminster <laughs> in the sixth year of football against uh, West Ham United. I love the FA Cup. It's always good. I feel that uh, the smaller teams, James Bench, should automatically just host those games just uh, so they get that revenue. I think that would be kind of interesting. What do you think? Well, but then a lot of them kind of want to go to our... So I remember... Yeah, um, that's true. The, they want to go to the, the great, bit, yeah. The greatest upset I've ever been at, and therefore I'd consider to be the greatest upset, uh, <laughs> when I was about 11, 12, 13, um, Shrewsbury Town hosted... Wayne Rooney's Everton, which gives you an idea how long ago this was, uh, beat them 2-1, Nigel Jempson free kick. And mm. yeah, uh, this was at the Gay Meadow. It's a ground right by the River Severn, mm. floods half the year. Um, it, it does. It's such a great equaliser having them at home. And I, I think you could probably do more. Um, let them host it at home, but, you know, like maybe give them the t some of the TV money as well, um, you know, extra TV money, however you, however you do it, just because... It is what makes this competition special. And yeah, I mean, Kidderminster, not a place I'd visit otherwise, but it'd be I, mean, no. I think it's a tough place to go, um, even if you're not going to play football. Uh, and West Ham will certainly, I think, find it hard going. And if you're looking for an upset for some long odds, that's a good shout there, Louise. There you go. Uh, Michael, I knew that I stole a little bit of line from you, but anything else that you wanted to add? I mean, I know that you've got the PSG game, uh, but. Yeah. If there's anything else, as we say goodbye, don't forget, by the way, to follow Michael on Twitter, Instagram, of course, and obviously the color analyst of Austin FC as well. MLS getting closer, my friend. Yeah, that was what I was going to say. I I'm excited for a new MLS season with, with so much happening, especially the U.S. national team, the Canadian national team. Mm. Uh, the, the, the success of Canada. James loves Canada, by the way, Michael. Yeah, Canada, hey, right? yeah. You know what, James? We just became best friends. I love <laughs> Team Canada. <laughs> We're going to Qatar to win it all. Oh, they're, they're in. One point, they're in. We're but I, 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 I love seeing the success of both of those national teams. And success, we, we put a lowercase s for the U.S. national team because they're still the jury's out on them. But both teams, they are the flagship for the talent that's being developed here in Major League Soccer and also abroad. Um, my favorite player to watch, Jonathan David. I, I, that, I can't wait to see him get sold somewhere else. He is the best striker in CONCACAF. But it, it's been, a, it's been a, a joy to watch CONCACAF qualifiers, and, and now it's time for Major League Soccer. So looking forward to, to getting going on that front. I love it, my friend. I love it. And that is it, everybody. That's our weekend preview. Kristen Cooper was here earlier. Michael LaHoo, James Bench, thank you so much for being part of the show. James Bench, it's been so long. I'm so happy you're back. Thank you so much, brother. Well, it's good to be back. I'll see you soon to chat Club World Cup. I know you can hardly wait. <laughs> I cannot wait. Michael, always a pleasure, buddy. Ah, loved being back on. Cannot wait for today's other AFCON semifinal and can't wait. Hopefully Tosin is watching this episode because, um, you know, love you, love you, buddy. But, um, yeah, looking forward to being right about Senegal. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Nigerian Scams is always watching something and 100%. <laughs> but thank you so much for being part of the family, everybody. Kego Lasso Pod on Twitter. Uh, James Bench, Michael Hood, LME as well on Twitter. Hey, by the way, we're nearly there to 10,000 subscribers on YouTube. Thank you so much much for that we're on spotify apple Podcasts, anywhere you listen to your pod cbs sports and your cbs sports app club football is back thank you so much have a great great weekend we'll see you next time